All right, so don't watch this if you don't want to see my frustration and cursing and all that, because this is just a setup video. And, uh, you know, it, the setup for this game was very painful and my psychological state is not the best. So I'm hoping that the videos for the actual, you know, once we actually get into the game, I'll be a little bit less uh, frustrating to me. But if you enjoy watching me have a horrible time, you know, coping with things, uh, well, it's up for that. Or if you really are interested in uh, uh, some of the thoughts on the setup, but honestly, uh, you can probably skip at least half the video because it took me forever to start actually putting pieces on the board. I'm dragging my feet a little bit more on Beast Lord, a couple of days worth, and that, that I think is going to become a kind of standard thing with this unless it kind of hooks me. <laughs> Especially since I'm downloading Witcher 3 finally. Uh, eh, I may not be able to actually play it on my machine, so that won't be an issue. But there's no real... Um, unified sort of here's how you set up the game there's a bunch and this is so much with these rules there's a bunch of words you know that all kind of work towards it there's a large section of setup but there's no real simple like hey deal out these cards first or something that i found but it doesn't make much sense unless you deal them out so uh, that's that's what I'm doing at this point. But there's a lot of stuff like, you know, they're talking about all unit counters must be punched out of their frames. Okay, great. And then they talk about setting that all up and 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 preparing, which I kind of have done. But now they're at map board setup, and I don't think there was anything that handled handing those cards out. They have the understanding the card, but that's not part of the setup. Uh, it's just really obnoxious. Um, like what would be nice is a simple quick hey here's how you actually set up of course that would be true with all the rules because the game's really not that complicated but the rules are just so fucking annoying and i'm trying to read ultimatum's rules and they are too you quinto just man they fucking don't know how to write rules all right so i'll try to figure out who sets up where there is one confusing thing which is in the setup the Beast Lord is supposed to be to the north um, in terms of where they sit, but obviously the Beast Lord pieces actually go here. That matches that. So I don't know, you know, there's, there's a lot that's probably wrong in these rules as well, so I wouldn't put it past them. We'll see where they end up being placed on the board. And to the annoyance, and this will work fine if you know the game well, but you have to do this counter setup. You have to set your counters up on here before you set your pieces on the board. So you don't, you know, if you're following these directions trying to figure out what's going on, you don't know, you know, what forces you're building where or whatever if you follow it directly. Obviously, I'm going to try to mash things together so that I get some kind of handle on some sort of strategy or whatever, but man, just fucking annoying. Okay. Well, in a very slow way. I've managed to put all the settlements down. Now, I don't think other people's settlements affect where you can place yours. So for example, I've got a human one here. They can't be within seven of any other settlement, but it, had the order of placement been different, um, there would be no way. So order of placement's random. And say the humans and the Beastmaster had switched. Well, the humans could have placed here and then the Beastmaster is not allowed to place within one. I think it's only of your own settlements. Um, most of the settlements I've tried to look at the points that the different players have and they have different viewpoints towards things and put their most valuable uh, settlements far away from the enemy or closer to borders that they're planning on being aggressive on. So for example, the goblins, I think, really want to hit the elves because of their victory point card. The humans is a slightly different situation because most of our settlements are towns and hamlets, but we have a small, well, a fair amount of castles. Castles are better defensively, so I flung them forward, even though they're more valuable than the towns and settlements. Hey, uh, 
we'll try to figure out how to set up the actual units in a little bit. Theoretically, they should have already all been placed on here before I started putting any settlements down, etc. I can't think that way. I'd have had to pre-do this, kept it in my mind, you know, uh, pre-figure where the settlements are going to go, kept that in my mind, and then allocated troops where I wanted them. And, you know, to be honest, the players should know where the enemy settlements are before they allocate their forces. So even though the game suggests a different order, I mean, you, you sort of do. You know where the settlements are before you place the unit counters. The only question is how you're going to configure those unit counters. You know, how, how many of them do you need on the board that are real? And how many troops in each one that's real? And, you know, honestly, it's just easier if the settlements are on the board already. Right now, um, and again, all of this is supposed to be completely pre-planned, but I'm not doing it that way. We roll the initiative again for placement of the troop counters, which should have already been set up. Uh, the troop counters are going to be set up either in the habitations or on some of these uh, army markers. You can use dummies. They all have to be within the original setup regions, which are pretty much defined by the habitations. I mean, green can be as far as here, for example. Blue can be on that side. We get a different ordering. There's one special rule, which is the Beastmaster is allowed to take a significant quantity of his troops and create a strike force that comes from the edge of the map. I forgot about that when I set up my pieces, but here's the thing. I don't know who he's going to go after. And basically he can set them up and say they come in on turn X. And the nice thing about that is if I make that a few turns into the game, the mobile forces of that uh, army are probably going to be engaged in doing something else. Of course, they might be engaged in wiping out the Beastmaster. The danger with that, though, is the dragons over there. Plus, the Beastmaster may be holding his troops in reserve and, you know, be ready to throw a strike at someone who comes at him, wipe them out, and, you know, maybe get some kind of advantage out of that. So there's a lot of uncertainty as to his placement. Everyone else, well, there's significant uncertainty. For example, the men have a lot of territory. They could go after three different players very easily. And everyone else, too. Uh, you know, these green goblins, they can go after the men, they can go after the Beastmaster, they can go after the elves. So everybody's got a... can set up based on their victory conditions as to what they want to do. Of course, I'm taking forever getting this all set up, but whatever. The first of the people to set up their military units, and I'll get to the spies at the end, are the elves. Great. I start sorting them out. Here's the problem. The elves have, and I mean, you know, it's not, there's ways around it, but the elves have one, two, three, four, five magic swords, three magic bows. Now, you can only use one of them for any military character. How many military characters do they have? One, two, three, four. That's the heroes and the lord. Five, six, the princess and their wizard. And I think that's it. <laughs> Those are the only things that can use them. Which means that I've got six people with like eight or nine different pieces of equipment. So we got to have either... Some people can be carrying them, which is kind of weird. That they're, you know, they can carry a bow and a, a sword. No big deal there. But I'm not sure that makes a lot of sense. However, I don't think there's a way that they can lose the bow or sword and thus, you know, have to have the other one, right? <laughs> uh, there are some conditions under which maybe you'd want to, like, fire at a distance with the bow and then engage with the sword later or something like that. Uh, but for the most part, it, it doesn't seem like a terribly valuable uh, thing to have both. And I could assign the sword of the bow to non-military persons, like to units and such. Not, and they're useless, but then they're at least not fixed to one unit. But the thing is, that's where I'm thinking, well, yeah, but how am I going to lose one of these items? So I guess some people are going to have double items in the hope that maybe the bow, you know, comes in handy 
on the tactical map, especially in a situation where I get in a fight and I want to shoot an arrow, you know, I'm too far away to engage with my big sword or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know because you're only allowed to be using one on any given, at any given time. It kills me here, and I think I'm just going to walk away for a while, another day or two or whatever. <laughs> it's, it, it, it's such a free setup situation. You know, I don't even have stacking limitations for the most part, except inside all the things. And anywhere where there's kind of rules in this game, uh, it's really a pain in the ass because you have to look them up and find them. Uh, but there's a lot that's just left so open, you know, not to interpretation, but eh, I can set my pieces up anywhere in this kind of area. And so I'm probably going to try to build a big stack to go exploit the Beast Lord because when I look at my points, that's what I'm most worried about. But then... I still do have to worry about, you know, defending against other things, especially the Beast Lord who can come in along the map edge. Uh, or, I don't know, the humans or goblins might come after me, but I'm pretty far from them. So, at least from their habitations, not from where they can be. The humans could be right up here. The goblins, well, it's a few turns to get to my habitations. There's also weird stuff like uh, my magic loot is worth nothing to me. So, I'm not going to protect that all that terribly. Given that there's stacking limitations in the habitations, there's sort of not room for that stuff, so <laughs> screw that. The regular loot I do have to protect, though, so I'm trying to put that, but there's only 10 things can go in the castle. The town or nest can hold, like, 20. I have no idea how it's all going to play out. So I'm like, you know, shooting completely blind trying to figure out, well, where do I want to set stuff up <laughs> That's kind of frustrating, but sort of exciting when you, you know, are playing a game opposed. And it's just fucking annoying when you're trying to set it up and get a feel for a game solo. Uh, I just, nah, I don't want to do it, you know? <laughs> so, maybe we'll get through part of this or something someday. But I just don't have the spirit to be playing right now. Um, you know, and normally it's this sense of duty to get the shit out. Well, my life's so fucked up now because of the move that everything's disordered, nothing makes sense anymore, and I'm in complete emotional collapse. Basically, all my patterns, you know, I was talking about patterns in the one rant, all my patterns are gone, which means none of this shit means anything. You know, I'm building one back, I'm working. Right? <laughs> that I'm still doing. But uh, it, it's really, really hard for me to get into uh, things that I can't clearly justify. And doing these gaming bits is hard to justify. I could be out exploring the town or playing video games or picking my nose or whatever, you know? Yay, I finally got through. Uh, one of the problems is with no stacking, with no real idea beyond these points what my general goals are it's so loose i just and so many fucking pieces you know in some games like a space game or something usually you have like three or four pieces at the beginning of the game and you may have just as open a setup or something yeah. although in a lot of cases you're starting in one planet or something but in some games, you have a fairly open setup, but you don't have a lot of pieces. But here, you've just got so much, and you've got no idea how it's all going to interact. Uh, because there's so many little roles that are kind of throwaways, you know? I mean, I can barely, like, stacking limits. I have to look that up constantly. There's no player aids beyond what's on the board. Uh, and there's so many little roles that you have to look up that I, I'm not... Really what should be done, because a player aid is not the right place for uh, this kind of picky and stuff, what really should be done is the rule book should be rewritten, uh, condensed down to about 12 to 16 pages, <laughs> larger type, and, uh, you know, you could probably have all the same information if they stopped repeating the same thing and actually got to the point of, you know, what the, the actual rule is supposed to be. And then a lot of it could be presented in chart form. 
it would just be easier to digest because as it stands, you know, hey, I vaguely knew, and part of this is because I keep walking away from the thing in disgust, I vaguely knew that there's stacking limits in the locations. So, or I was pretty sure there was, but then I have to look it up and each time I have to look it up, right? And then I walk away in disgust thinking, well, I have no fucking clue what I'm doing. You know? uh, but what we have is, because there are stacking limits in the locations, I ended up making my town my most important location because that can hold 20 units. And that's where my princess and my wizard, I think, are. I'm not sure. Can't see the princess now. Oh, there she is. Uh, what's worse is like the bow and the sword. These count as units. <laughs> so <clears throat> they count against the stacking limit. I can understand everything else. Pigs, treasure, stuff like that takes up space. But the bow, I'm carrying this fucking thing, you know. Um, oops. I forgot to throw a lot of... Uh, I got, I'm not done. I haven't put the spies down yet, but those I put after everything else. Uh, it's just the way I think it's supposed to happen. But I forgot to put a bunch of my bowmen down. But basically, I created one big striking force. Oh, uh, I probably ought to put some uh, some dummies on the board, too. Uh, let's put a dummy here. Let's put a dummy here. We have so many pieces, we might as well. Let's put a dummy here. Let's put a dummy there. Uh, and let's put a dummy in the back fields. I actually probably should have put defenses in the back area, um, but I figure I can react and move back with something else. Because if the whole Beast Lord like invasion force comes in in my back area, I'm pretty much hosed unless I bring my whole big army. And that, that's the thing. I've created one huge army that I'm meaning to throw against the Beastmaster. And the other armies are meant to be reactive forces uh, against attacks and launch saved by the goblins or the humans. But if the Beastmaster comes in behind me, I got real problems and I need to deal with those. A lot of this is just based on the point values I have. And I know I haven't gotten started playing it's just <laughs> it, trying to grasp everything that I'm trying to, you know, uh, express in my setup is, is not, uh, is where this has become very painful. And I don't usually do this, but, you know, I'm spending days on setup, not actual days of playing time, but uh, just because of the angst involved in trying to deal with this game. And unfortunately... Here we are with what I thought would be, hey, let's do the men now. I've got kind of a pattern with the elves. You know, I'll just throw pieces out. we got to get playing, right? Well, and I'll do that, but I ran into a hitch. I can't figure out what the fuck uh, the, pre the priests and bishops, they have this number to the right here. So... Movement factor, this would normally be missile factor. It might be, but this is not explained that I can find in the rules. There's this understanding the unit counters. There's nothing about priests and bishops in this, and I can't find anything in the optional or anything else. It might be a combat modifier. That's what it looks most like, and that's what I'm going to take it as. <coughs> um, unfortunately, I'll have to look in the tactical rules, because combat modifier makes a lot of sense in the strategic game, but actually it doesn't, uh, because the combat modifiers are like multiplied and added to your strength or something like that. So I think like if the bishop is with troops, he counts as a leader or something in the sense that he gives them a bonus to their particular die roll. He's the equivalent to a standard. Now he can carry uh, an icon. I'm not sure if he's carrying, I, I'm pretty sure that Stacking is not by the unit counter. Uh, if it is, we've got a problem and in, in terms of the tactical stacking because <coughs> unit counter is defined as everything in this game. And if you're starting to count, you know, weaponry and stuff that people are carrying as unit counters over here and on the board, 
And it's obvious to me that the rules aren't doing what they want to express because the tactical game doesn't handle it that way. And then the question becomes, okay, you know, can you stack a human for free, you know, a leader for free or what? And all kinds of confusion like that. So I've opened up a whole new can of worms uh, by thinking about this issue. Right? I found it then. So uh, this unit counter maximum includes only warrior units, civilian units, and horse and pig units. Nothing else counts. So I got to redo the elves now. And I don't know how much to redo them, but certainly uh, my whole plan having to do with the castle and everything was like, oh shit, I can only hold 10 things in here. I can't make that a good defensive place. Well, now if loot and uh, what else, you know, personalities and stuff can be in there, everything that I did is fucked up. And you could say, well, you could just read the rules better. Yeah, you know, these rules fucking suck. I ha still haven't gotten to how this works over in the tactical game, but I thought I'd, uh, you know, trace the full line of the stacking limitations and everything. Why the fuck? Why? Why would you write it as stacking refers to the placement of counters? Uh, there's no limit to the number of unit counters in a single lettered box. There is a limit to the number of unit counters. Now, unit counters is defined, and it is every fucking piece in the game. It really is. Uh, and this is just, you know. And then, I don't know. I, I just, I, I want to give up gaming at this point, you know. I mean, that's what this is essentially doing. It's not like I never want to play board games. It's just... I have to do this because I've started it and I can't stop. I, can't, I have to give it more of a shot, but man, is it killing me. So maybe there's some new definition here as well, hidden somewhere. But under stacking here, only two counters may be stacked in a single clear or hill hex. That means that it doesn't say unit counters, but I don't think there's any disambiguation between the two. Uh, but that seems even more broadly interpretable, you know, only two counters. And uh, that means if I've got like the Elf Lord with his sword and bow, they can't all be together. He has to drop one of them, which can never be used again by anyone because a human or a, a person carried it. Um, and then we've got some specials. Let's see if this handles it. Military and non-military personalities, weapon, magic weapons and special items do not count. I, you know, <laughs> Don't put an exception at the end. Define what the fuck actually stacks and, and, and use a word for that. Uh, don't make it the last thing so that, you know, you're, you're working through it. Again, I didn't see it. It's because every fucking sentence has its own goddamn name to, number to it. You know, it's just, your quinto is so impossible for me to absorb. And this is why even though they have some games that I've liked and that are cool, um, a lot of times their stuff just sits on the shelf because I look at the rules and I'm like, I don't want to fucking face this. Well, I don't want to fucking face this. Turns out it's a good thing that I tried to rearrange the elves because I saw this X here for castles. That means they don't have one. Well. They had troops allocated to a castle. It turns out, as I look through these, that's a shrine. Now, the counters are fairly difficult to identify easily, just because there's so many different types, and it's based on, you know, artwork. These, these aren't terrible, uh, but I actually have trouble with, like, the hamlet and the town. Uh, there, there, there are a fair number of things that I have difficulty um assessing what they're they're going to be it turns out that i've got a unit on top of the shrine it's a dummy but i'm hoping you know that's enough but the beast lord's going to know where that is if his goal if his biggest point thing is like taking out the elven shrine well i'm screwed but otherwise uh, my perimeter should be good enough to handle the other opponents now we go back to the humans and try to do them. I rectified the stacking, I guess, but it's gonna be a lot harder to count the stacking because 
it's not obvious, you know, you've got to go look up now, hey, what, what units count, what units don't, this, that, and the other. It would be nice if there were identifiers, you know, I don't know what they could be, but like a little white dot or something like that. But these are all just, you know, printed black on a color. Uh, it's that era, and this game, I think, is too ambitious in terms of the different number of unit types, etc., and the kind of crappy artistic uh, usage to, to be able to handle. I mean, yeah, look at look at the artwork on these. You know, they try to this and this. They're both big black blobs from any distance, but when you zoom in, you can start to see the differences. Well, you got to be able to make those differentiations. And the same thing with the. It's even harder with the towns and hamlets and such. This is just a fucking nightmare. We made some significant grounds. Uh, set up my humans, and they have a focus on trying to kill either beast lords or dragons with this central piece. They've got some mobile units uh, because the cav is so good in the planes, I guess. Uh, I've set those up. They have one little piece that's difficult, which is they have these fortification pieces. Now, those are an optional role. And obviously, you know, like a lot of other things, it took me a while to find where the rule is, etc. on it. And mainly to figure out that this isn't just a regular thing that goes on the board. It's not a habitation. It has two ways it can be used. Some of them are being used, and they'll add, I guess, to the siege combat value. That's not clearly spelled out how that works. <coughs> but... Uh, but they add to the combat of habitations, and the only way that makes sense is if it's to the siege, if it's a die roll modifier on the siege table. So that seems to be the only way to resolve that. But the ones that they kept, they kept two out. Those can be used, basically, uh, you can build encampments, and I guess the goblins have this capability too. You can build encampments with any armies. But the guys who have fortifications can upgrade those encampments and build a fortification instead. Um, the ones that are on habitations are one use. If the habitation is destroyed, those fortification markers go away and they're not worth anything to anyone. These guys, though, can be used with the mobile forces. And you can basically spend movement points, I think, to encamp your forces. And you can drop a fort down, kind of like a Roman fort. And then, you know, you're a little bit better on defense. <clears throat> I don't know how valuable they're going to be. So I come in terms of, hey, the things I really want to defend are actually the habitations. How big a deal is it for me to, you know, be able to move forward and drop a fort somewhere? Because there's not really, there's not really any kind of interdiction capabilities of a fort being in place or anything like that. And I don't see too much... You know, there's no supply rules or anything like that, so there's not too much reason uh, for... Um, there's not too much reason that being in one particular location is going to be particularly annoying to your enemy that I can understand. So, hey, you know, I fortify, great. I'm a little better defended. What's that going to do for me? I can't think of anything. But I did keep a couple just because, well... I've got most of the habitations covered. <clears throat> I did not cover all of them, and I hope I'm... It, it, it's the, the damn different pictures cause so much trouble. So there's a town somewhere. I think that's this one. And then is there a shrine or anything like that? I know some of them. I don't think there is for the humans. Oh. Now I'm on the Beastmaster, and remember, he gets to split his forces, but certain forces start in certain places. Like, some of the forces, the water-based stuff, all has to be here, and all the treasure has to be there, and the breeders and such. Uh, I'm going to mainly, I think, focus on creating a mobile force to attack, of all people, I don't remember who anymore. Was it the goblins? I've got good points on the goblins. So I think what we're going to see is some, the goblins are going to have a lot of trouble just because of the card draws for the victory points because both the humans and the beast lord look like they have a desire to hit the goblins. Um, 
it looks like we get more points for hitting goblin stuff than we do elf stuff. And that, that's one of the things that kind of is going to spur this game to be a little different each time, is the victory conditions are different each time. Um, so I've pulled out this stuff. Uh, it has to be here. And I had something I wanted to say. Oh, yeah, I found uh, a tie. Uh, a counter that probably has a rata somewhere, but I can't find shit on this game. Um, this guy. Now, he is the same image as these other captains, I hope. I hope there's nothing else that could be him. He's got the same image as these other captains, but instead of having a uh, uh, pretty lousy movement value in this guy's case. Wow, these guys are just totally different. What the fuck? <sighs> Each one of these is completely different. So this guy seems to act almost like a priest, which would make him a non-military personality, but there's nothing like that. This guy has, I guess, normal values, except he does have magic, I think. That's hard to tell because he doesn't have the MP on there. And then this guy... None of them have morale, but that's okay, I think, on leaders. Isn't it? That's an engineer. Yeah, leader type, I think, don't have a morale. So I don't know what the hell to do, because all three of these are very different. Maybe there's a rule on them, but I don't remember seeing anything like that. Okay, finished up with the Beast Lord setup. And what you can see here, I've created one huge stack. That's coming in on turn two, um, over near the goblins. I haven't decided the exact hex, I'll write that down. But uh, I probably should do that before they s the goblins set up. But the point is, uh, I can tell you where it's gonna be. It's gonna be like right here, because this is their home. It'll be coming in on this road. Uh, the reason is, I get a lot of points for killing goblins. I don't really care about my own stuff. The only negative to that, all that is, I'm sending the Beast Lord in with that stack, which means I may not be able to do things uh, that I want to do with the dragon, but that's okay. My main city is protected by the dragon to some extent. I kind of don't want to cause the dragon any irritation. And why is that a big deal? Well, because the dragon isn't mine no matter what, but he's sitting on top of the Beast Lord's sword. Any attempt to like move military units around there is gonna trigger the dragon to attack, and that's dangerous. So uh, that's that's one good reason not to have the Beast Lord here. Now, the real question is, out of the people who've set up so far, looking at things, with my knowledge, the humans have an option. They're either gonna go after the goblins or the Beast Lord. Uh, I don't remember what the elves are doing. I think they're going after the Beast Lord. So somebody is going to be putting pressure on the Beast Lord. And that's actually a big deal because the Beast Lord has not defended his homes very well. And we'll see how that all works out. He's pretty much put everything he could into the castle. Now, this looks like a lot of stuff. And castles only have a stack limit of 10. But this is like all treasures. There's personalities and stuff in here. So I think I'm following the rules so far. Now on to the goblin troops. And yes, this is taking fucking forever, but I think we're finally beginning to see where I get to start playing, assuming that my mental state allows it. <laughs> and finished up the military unit placement where I combined two things, which is putting things on these and putting the actual holding counters on the board. Uh, the goblins put a very strong force uh, here prepared to invade the elves. They've got a covering force here. If either the, gobble, uh, if either the uh, beast lord or the humans comes charging in, <laughs> maybe you can do something. A lot of force put into defending our territories, especially this town nest. I'm gonna recount this. Looks like there's more than 20 there, and I may have to re reposition some. I may reposition some into that force B because that's awfully weak and it's covering some of the defenses. Uh, some dummies, you know, will make it look like there's some defense back here, uh, other options elsewhere, all, all that set up. Let me throw another dummy down here. 
There's nothing that keeps me from stacking them, but uh, <coughs> I can always relieve in a, a siege. So um, these guys are good in the mountains. Of course, their territory is all mountains, so they're better on defense. But but all their points are over attacking the elves. They put their biggest mobile force against the elves. It may not be big enough if the elves have forces here. One of the things you can start to see from the setup, and you know, just thinking about the game a little bit, so it looks like at least the initial effort in the game is going to tell a lot of the first few turns sto uh, story. It's all this hidden placement and you know secret units and everything. And that means, well, there's not a lot of room for much other than the guesswork as to, you know, where you've set up. Now, that guesswork is somewhat decided by these little cards and the victory points that you get there. So, you know, I mean, the goblin said, oh, I want to capture elf stuff. Well, that's great. That's where I will focus most of my effort, but I'm also really interested in defending my own stuff. Uh, you could, of course, not go with your card but since nobody else knows your card there's not going to be any bluff factor to that what's really going to drive people's uh, decisions here is what cards they're they're getting and you know what what they don't know about other people's positioning you know you don't want to strip a border because hey you got no idea where their troops are of course if that huge beast man army shows up and somebody sees it then they know the beast man no, the Beast Lord is just completely, uh, you know, vulnerable. Uh, likewise, though, in some other cases, you know, if if you run into a big castle or something, you may know that the mobile forces are, well, a castle's not going to do it. And honestly, it's only mobile forces that are going to hold the majority of the troops. So again, i got to recount this, make sure I've got only 20 there. There's a lot of treasure and stuff in there, but there are also breeders. I think the royal family doesn't count as a unit, so... Not positive of that. Time to dig back into the rule book and try to find, you know, what's excluded where. And we're finished with the final step of the setup, which is placement of the spies. I rolled a new set of numbers. I don't know if you're supposed to do that. It seems to indicate you use the same numbers as before, but since I rolled a new set of numbers for uh, the unit placement, well, I figure it randomizes things. It, it puts a little bit more uncertainty into the setup uh, uh, situation because otherwise, whoever placed their uh, uh, habitations first and then places their troops first and then places their spies first, they're just constantly getting, you know, uh, having to reveal information before everyone else. Maybe it's not a lot of information, but... Uh, the more randomized I can do that, uh, the better I think the eventual uh, starting position, you know, in terms of just, I don't know, more balanced. Um, choice of spies, you can see they're all on top of enemy units because they can do an information gathering mission. And the question is, what do you want to look at? In general, uh, I've got them looking at mobile forces. Now we've got the goblins and the elves looking at each other. They actually both, I think, want to fight each other. I know that they, uh, I don't remember which one wants to, really wants to cross. I think it's the goblins really want to hit the elves. Um, and the goblins have a problem. They only have one spy. It's hard to disguise yourself as something. Wow, the beast men are pretty damn weird looking. <coughs> um, and... He's thinking about using that not just to get information, but also, if need be, to conduct assassinations or sabotage missions against uh, uh, fortifications or something like that to try to, uh, you know, help his military cause. On the other side, it's mainly information gathering. Although, you know, if the humans are going against the goblins, which I think they are, they may also do some... some uh, some military operations, and if somebody's coming across at you, you can use your spy for those. There's a risk to everything except information gathering, though. There's a chance your spy gets killed, caught, whatever. And then he's just gone, you know, and somebody else gets victory points for him. The Beastmen, with no mobile troops, didn't attract a lot of spying. They're using all theirs on, uh, on the outer, you know, near their cities uh, or, or locations. <sighs> Habitations. 
because if they put them on the edge of the map, or if they put one on the edge of the map, that's sort of a telegraphic move. And they really don't want to let anybody know who they're going after. Now, they could put it on the wrong edge of the map and uh, maybe dissuade someone from projecting forces far from that direction. But I don't know. I, that, that would have been perhaps clever, or put them on several different sides. So the different people. Uh, we're going to stop here. <laughs> yeah, I made it through the setup. That's it. Uh, we're going to stop here, and I'm going to load this up, because I don't know how valuable this video is. It doesn't show you much to do with play. It shows me ranting and cursing. And, you know, I apologize, but I think there is something of interest in the setup. I just don't know how many people it's going to be valuable to. And, uh, yeah. So, if I could go back to the beginning, or if I was willing to edit, I could just say, hey. You know what? I can do that anyway. I'll do a prequel. Be back in a bit.